Welcome aboard. OK, so what I'm going to go through in the next 45 minutes or so, in fact, let me start my countdown timer. Uh, well, actually worth mentioning that because that's something I use in my troubleshooting, not so much the countdown, but a, a clock again available on GitHub where something happens. Like, if, for instance, if you're watching a log on actually in real time and you want to mark when you uh, click the icon in storefront or, or whatever else. Again, this presentation applies to any any EUC technology. Uh, I'll be actually using AVD. We can just hit mark and then put your text in. Guy says something not funny, but I mean, yeah, okay, that's pretty much all the time, isn't it? And we can go, then you can go back to it and you can see differences and so on. I find it quite useful. Anyway, that's more of an aside. So let's crack on with the content, which is going to be a few slides, mainly to remind me what to demonstrate. Okay, so what do we want to do? Well, users are never happy with log on times, are they? Well, and I'm sure some of you are screaming, yeah, I've got to wind down to 15 seconds. Yeah, but is it always 15 seconds? It's sometimes 15 seconds, sometimes 30 seconds, or there was an error, or the user's not getting a particular app. Yeah, there were always going to be potentially problems that we need to investigate. Uh, I've done a fair bit of that in my 27 years in the in the EUC world, but I'm still learning, learning from my peers, but coming up with new techniques and so on. So one of the go-tos is Sys Internals Process Monitor, which is great. Yeah, uh, there's a skill in itself, and I've done separate presentations before now about actually how to understand the data because it throws a heck of a lot at you. And you've got to work out what's relevant, but the biggie, and I'm not going to use uh, Process Monitor in this demo uh, at, at all, or this session at all, is because you've got to know there's going to be a, uh, a process issue or a logon issue or you know, some kind of a user complaint. So what if the user rings up and said, well, I logged on two hours ago and I had a problem. You go, ah, yes, I'll just jump in my time machine, go back, get on that machine and run Process Monitor. Uh, yeah, I think if I had a time machine, I'd probably do better things than running back in time and looking at user logons. So it's great if you can reproduce the problem. Uh, we can use it for um, non -in, sorry, non multi session operating systems. That's what I was struggling for. So it's still early in the morning for me. That's my excuse. Not as early as for Eric, though. So that's a bit of a poor excuse. And uh, let me find my AVD session. So we can actually run propmon with various commands so if you've got a uh a, a remoting or ps exec then you can run it with a slash backing file to a, a local file uh, except eula is, a, is a one a lot of people forget no filter and you can either give it a runtime of a specified number of seconds if you know how long the logon's probably going to take or you can leave it running and then hit it with a slash terminate later on and that will terminate it cleanly so that the trace file is good you know what happens if if propmon dies mid trace even if you record into a backing file it probably won't be usable anyway that's enough about propmon because we don't have our crystal ball we don't have our time machine well i don't have a time machine anyway uh, not yet that's in about two weeks i think so one of the go-to's this always used to be the answer for uh Microsoft exams, mind you, I've not done a Microsoft exam since my NT351 MCSE in about 1997 or something like that. Well, I'm supposed to do some of these Azure things soon. Um, but there's a lot of information stored in there. The downside of that is where do, where do we look? So, yeah, we bring up good old event viewer. Who doesn't spend time in event viewer and it's great and we go okay well what am i looking for when was when did the user log on okay well when the user logged on is roughly about 801 this is running in um utc so it's now behind i don't get up that, that early normally unless i've got a meeting which i try and avoid so you can see this is an avd session so i could go and say okay well let's go and have a look at my log my windows logs from 801 and go and see what there is just in these yeah, the application security and system but whoa, hold on this is uh, the modern world where we've got a heck of a lot more log files event logs yeah we've got well in fact we can actually see how many there are on this endpoint um, we can do a get win event minus list log pattern match and do a measure and 
Yeah, 464 different event logs. So fill your boots, look through all those nice event logs, which ones are relevant, which ones aren't. Who knows? Who cares? Yeah, I don't really want to trawl through that. I mean, I've written a script for this, which you'll see, which is available on GitHub, um, which is my one of my go to's for most troubleshooting, not just log on, many other problems. And yeah, it just saves a lot of time. Yeah, I, I, I joke that I'm lazy. That's why I write these scripts, because I can't be bothered to look through event logs. So let's uh, run up the first script, which is something called event aggregator. Um, so I think it's in this folder. That'd be good if I got focus, wouldn't it? And the keyboard worked and I didn't could type. But other than that, so what I can say is I'm going to start. I'm actually going to start at 0800 just in case anything happens just before it. And I'm going to give it a duration of, well, let's say, two minutes, for instance. So this is now going to look at all the event logs. So all 464 to see what's available. Now, this is a actually a multi-user uh, Win 10 in Azure AVD. Uh, if it's single user OS, these scripts can be run remotely. So as long as you've got remoting set up and this is just for event logs, it doesn't need the full PowerShell remoting, then I can actually remote to connect to the event logs and run it that way. I don't need to be on the machine. So after thinking about it for quite a while, we'll see it comes back with uh, one or two events. I mean, I can actually save these to a CSV if I, you know, if I want to come back and look at them later, or if I want to compare good with bad. The consultant's favourite game is spot the difference. Yeah, this user works, this one doesn't, or this machine works, this one doesn't, or this user worked today, didn't work yesterday, or vice versa. And uh, yeah, so you can save all these things to file to be able to be able to compare and play spot the difference. So if I look for my uh, username, for instance, of the person who logged on, which is the famous Billy Bob, we can see various things happening. Now, of course, what I'm doing here is this is a perfectly good log on, seemed to run OK. So I'm not really looking for any issues. So I'm just really introducing you to this to this script. Yeah, you know, we can actually make it so that we filter just on errors. So we can see there's various columns. Now, the advantage of a grid view, which is built into PowerShell, if you don't know grid views, you're missing out big style. It's a great way of visualizing information without having to go to things like Excel. And um, what we can do is we can actually filter on level display name, for instance. So let's go add criteria, level display name, add does not contain information. So we're going to start looking for warnings and errors. The oh, the, the filter at the top, by the way, is a global filter. So that will match Billy Bo in any of the fields, whereas here I'm specifically looking just at the level display name field, if it actually wants to catch up. It does it live. So if there's a lot of events, it can be uh, quite long time to, to get those events up. So you can see now, uh, in fact, let's get rid of the machine name. So it's something else I can do in a grid view, get rid of machine name because it's all under one machine. As I can actually do this across multiple machines. I've also got a live event log tailor, um, which you can get on the uh, control up script library. So you can actually see event logs as they're created across uh, a number of event logs rather than having to go in after the fact. So we can see we've got some errors. Uh, yeah, some errors. We could filter just on errors. Verbose again, we probably don't want. So we could just filter on error or warning. But this was a good log on. And this is, I think, key with troubleshooting. Just because you see an error doesn't mean there was a problem. Yeah. So you have to look at a good log on. So if you've got a, a session where the, the log on was perfect, as far as you can tell, fast enough, all the apps were there, no errors, then you know, get a, uh, a trace of those events and compare and contrast, you know, try and spot the difference. Oh, I've got an error in the good one as well. Okay, well, that error is not relevant then, yeah? Don't think, oh, I've seen an error, that must be the problem, and then go down a rabbit hole only to find that, uh, yeah, that wasn't, didn't help you at all. Now, one further thing we can do is if you innate, and this is something I do in all my customer builds, and something I implore you to do is set up process auditing. This gives you a mine of information, not just for log on, but for security incidents, uh, for any sort of strange behavior you might want to 
uh, investigate standard windows feature creates you events 4688 and 4689 so if i do a notepad of eric is great as we all know he is no but I, yeah much as i want to create eric is great he is already so i don't need to do that I come back in here do an f5 and let's go and look at some of these let's have a look that was a process start on audioq.exe okay so what i'm going to actually have to do is to find it and this is where it starts to get a bit of a pain do you want to do this for a logon go and piece all these things together so you can see now i've got notepad of eric is great yeah so you can turn on uh process creation and termination auditing process creation is more is it's if you like more useful process termination will also give you durations of processes if you can work out the difference now this is all leading to guess what i was too lazy to read through all these so i wrote a script for it again publicly available on my github so what we can actually do is say uh get process durations i'm going to do the start again as eight am pardon me duration of two of your earth minutes and what that will do is go and look just purely at that security event log in that period. Now it will say it can't find some processes because they didn't start or stop in that window. There is a there is a way actually to tell it just to search it everything in that time frame, but look to the current time for the uh, terminations of every process. So what we can see here are all the processes which have been started in that. Uh, window that I specified of eight o'clock for two minutes. So we can see the start. Uh, subject log on ID 999 means it wasn't in a user session. If we look further down, we can see it will be uh, a larger number, hopefully. Yeah, there we go. So that'll be, again, that's an arbitrary number, but we know the ones with the same number are for the same session. 999 means effectively session zero but what we can see over here is that when something started when it ended and its exit code exit code zero generally means good uh, let's not get into true and false at this point in time but anything non-zero is an error so there we can see something uh, parent process of rdp clip ran something called rdp input.exe with those parameters and for some reason it gave an error but again if i run this for a good logon and i get that it's like well no that's not my problem or that's not the problem i'm looking at what do i tend to look at in here i tend to look at the you know the processes i expect to find so something called explorer you may have heard of if i can actually get to type it in that dialog box and, and actually spell it correctly as well it's always a bonus uh, there we go. So we can see Explorer gets launched by user init at 8.01 and 22 uh, UTC. Hasn't finished yet, which is a good sign if this session is still alive. Of course, the session doesn't need to be alive for this. Yeah, because as long as your event log is big enough, and that's what I would suggest, is that you know, for an event log, you can do this through PowerShell if you want, or wevtutil.exe. But just make sure your event log is of a decent size, particularly if on a multi-user system, uh, and particularly if your system's going to be up for a few days and you might need to troubleshoot it, something from yesterday, make your yeah, event log 100 meg, something like that. Yeah, this space is cheap these days, isn't it, after all? So that you can go back a, a long way in time. So this is kind of a time machine, but uh, yeah, without having to have the, uh, the DeLorean in its um, flux capacitor. Mine's currently in the workshop anyway. So we can see what time Explorer launched. If I keep that highlighted and get rid of the filter, we can see where Explorer launched in the scheme of things. So we can see the good old application compatibility stuff hasn't been disabled, for instance, but that'll lead me on to uh, Sys Internals auto runs. So what do I look for if I'm looking for a logon problem? If it's a slow logon, what I'm looking for are things that which are long durations which have exited particularly if you've been uh, if you can reproduce this so you've got your timestamps 
of you know, when you clicked on the icon, when the window started to appear, when the desktop appeared and so on. And then you can correlate the times that you've recorded in here with what you've got in, got in here. So for slow logons, I tend to look for long duration items, which aren't long duration items in a good trace. Yeah, or I'll look something which has got yeah, a bad exit code. Or if somebody says, yeah, this particular app hasn't been set up and you know something should run at logon for it, have a look to see if it did run, how long it ran for compared with a, a good situation and what its exit code was. But also I can use this for security um, information as well. So what it does by default, it was actually get information about the executable that's uh, been recorded in the event log as well. So if you want to look for stuff that's been run out of the user profile or hasn't uh, is unsigned or something like that, you can find that in here. So it's kind of a security tool and a problem analysis tool, not just logon analysis tool, all, all in one, as long as you've got that process auditing set, which is generally best set through group policy. And have as long as you've got command line auditing as well, then you'll get the command line in there as well. But of course, this is a good reason not to use clear text passwords on the command line because they'll get recorded in here. Although the security event log can only be read by uh, an admin, but it might be you've got some sensitive credentials to something in Azure or another system that you don't want somebody who's got local admin to uh, to access. Or if this is a uh, user's physical desktop, then it's very generally very, fairly easy to compromise that um, through you know, alternate boot and, and various other things. So that, that's the script for process durations. So there's, there's quite a lot of options to that, which you can put in if you want. I use control space now to show all the options. I can do quite a lot of filtering. We can even do a log on of. So I could do a log on of my good old user Billy Bob, and I don't even know, need to know what time they logged on. Or even a log on, yeah, log on around eight o'clock or thereabouts. Yeah. So all the all the lazy options I put in, so I don't have to find out other information. So it's a lot, lots of uh, useful things in there. Plus, of course, the full PowerShell help at the top of the script, and that's all in my GitHub repo. I'll post this presentation later and um, links to my GitHub as well. Okay, let's go back to some fantastically interesting uh, PowerPoint. I hope you like the template. GP results, yeah, we know about GP results, I hope, can be useful as well, what GPOs have run and why, looking at your OU membership, group membership and so on, that can give you a good amount of information. Don't forget, of course, there are scheduled tasks which run during logon. So again, we can find out about those. Uh, I'll come back to that in a little bit. Good old logon scripts. Love them or hate them, they're probably here to stay, even if there are other technologies like WEM and so on, which can kind of reduce the need for these. People tend to have them for, for printer mappings and if nothing else, and drive mappings, if people use still drive mappings, but these things have been around for eons. And again, this will help us see those logon scripts because we'll see the, the whatever scripting engine actually running the script within that uh, process durations log, similar to what actually you can get in process monitor in the process tree. If you do get a log on, uh, you can go uh, control T to see what processes spawn what, and that does a slightly better view in that it will uh, indent processes, which are child processes, where in the view I just showed you there, it was all, all flat, although it did show you the, the parent process, so you can work out who gets what. If anybody fancies turning that into a better graphical representation, feel free to grab the script off uh, GitHub and do that. My uh, Windows Windows skills, as in drawing windows, aren't that great. Don't forget, of course, local policy, unless you're blocking it with group policy from a top level. And device drivers, of course. Plus services. And user services, of course, which we've had in, in Windows 10 as well, which still run in session zero, but I'm uh, sorry, running your own session, but still a system. And that's a little bit of a gray area because some of the traditional troubleshooting tools aren't great with uh, user services as opposed to system services. So prop one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna breeze through. Um, so there's various ways of getting it to work on a single user OS, if you can, you know, narrow the user down to only running on one particular machine uh, you know putting others in maintenance mode or giving assigning them to a specific machine 
Uh, I won't go into the set HC side of things. A lot of AV products actually uh, stop that now because it was a great way to get uh, system level access. If you've got physical access to a machine, I tend to use remote PowerShell, uh, but that does need to be set up. And sometimes PS Exec, PS Exec can be great for setting up remote PowerShell if you haven't set it up in your base build or through group policy. The process tree I just mentioned, which is Control T, so similar to what we just saw in the grid view. And this is the key to to prop one. Yeah, what's what's noise and what's actually relevant. So you know, a typical PropMon filter of mine will have maybe 10 or 20 items in it. But and you can filter out other sessions. So if it's a multi-user OS, only filter on your user session ID and session zero, of course, because services are involved as well. So enough of that. Event logs, yeah, done this, done the demo. Oh, there's only 484 on that AVD. So, yeah, that was an easy job. But it's a case of where to look. Yeah, let's just look everywhere. And then we can further filter in the grid view or in Excel. Like I say, you can export it to CSV as well. Yeah, and that's what I would suggest you do is record a good trace. So when everything's working, particularly when you've just, you know, if you're a con uh, consultant, if you've just rolled out a new system, get traces of the logon into CSV. And then if you get called back by the customers say, oh, the logon's going really slowly. Oh, yeah, but you agreed it was good. And when I make it in 15 seconds, yeah, but that's 45 seconds. And I haven't touched anything. I've not changed anything. Yeah, we know when customers lie, don't we? Sorry, customers on the call, because their lips move. Yeah, of course you've changed something. You've just forgotten about it or your change control process wasn't good enough to capture it. So we now, to, we now need to unpick it. So then you can compare manually, unfortunately, unless you're good with comparing CSVs, which again, there are ways and means of doing it. I suspect in Excel, but I'm not a finance guy, or you can import CSVs into PowerShell and use as objects and compare them that way. But play the consultant's favorite game of spot the difference. So here's my trace from when it was 15 second log on. Here's the trace from when, when it was a 45 second log on. Let's compare and contrast, and both in terms of the, just the general event log output that I showed with the event aggregator script, but also with the process duration script as well. So it's something running for 30 seconds longer than it did before. It's something running for 30 seconds, something running that wasn't running when you, know, you put the system in. Again, spot the difference. Yeah, so it's them all doing the logon, but not with event view unless you're a masochist. Again, I've made the slides available. These are links to the uh, the scripts that I've been using. And so the two we've just seen. And just to re-emphasize, yeah, clear text passwords on command lines, not something I like. We yeah, use PS credentials where possible. They obfuscated a bit, but then you get things like net uh, use, which you know you can't pipe a password into, but then use new PS drive or something like that. Grid views, love them. I used to, until I found out about them. I used to export everything to CSV, open up in Excel, and yeah, that was always a bit of a pain because you generally don't have Excel installed where you're troubleshooting. Okay, so um, slight plug, but mainly because it's a script that I'm kind of responsible for and, and, and maintain and add new features to, along with uh, Trent and Ty, fellow Citrix CTP. The key to this, and I'm not because this isn't a product pitch. Is it doesn't need control up to run. So I'm just going to show you how to use it manually because we can download it from their script library without having to register, log on, or anything at all. It's totally anonymous. Does need the log on and process creation termination uh, auditing in place as we uh, I've shown you for my other script. And minimum number of parameters to actually get sense out of it is the, the domain slash username. And then it spits out a load of Sometimes interesting, sometimes well, what's this all about? But it gives you insight. And again, compare and contrast. Compare a fast logon or a normal logon with a, a slow logon. So let's flick back to a demonstration. And ALD guys latest. And now we have named parameters, which we didn't have uh, way back. We've been working with this group about four years now. So the domain, my domain name, this is AVD, it's my Microsoft one, a good old Billy Bob. And that's all I need. It'll go away, it'll look at all sorts of things, event logs primarily, um, but I'll go and find a whole load of 
useful and potentially interesting stuff about the logon of this user eventually. There we go. So let's have a look. I'm hoping the font sizes are okay. I'll drop this screen down to 1920, 1080. So you can see it tells us the username. There's not much in the way of group policy and other stuff happening here because it's in AVD. It tells us the exact logon time. This is from LSAS, the local security authority. Uh, Q user doesn't even give you the seconds, but that uses WTS API where the logon is generally later than the actual LSAS. Yes, I've authenticated you, you can carry on. Logon end is a bit subjective. When does logon end? Yeah, I forget actually how we uh, we measure it. It's not just Explorer launching, but it's a whole lot of other things finishing. So we can actually see the logon duration and the time split down. So we can see I'm using FS Logics in here. So we can see it took uh, 7.8 seconds to load the, the profile as in you'll get the bhdx mounted and set up as the the user profile actually loading the user profile itself for store group policy and so on so we can see um the biggest one by a long way is this load packages good old apex and look here thanks to trenton we now do a nice uh view of uh, what apex packages are loaded so you can look in and go hmm, yeah do i need all of these yeah, we don't have any Xbox ones in here or weather apps. At least there's been some tuning done in here. Uh, some of these um, could potentially be removed. This also, I think, was the first logon of this user. So this will be higher than further logons or subsequent logons. We can see the scheduled task, which I mentioned on an earlier slide. So we can see what actually was run at uh, logon again i think it was in was it server up to server 2019 there was some xbox ones and a server os it's like what are you joking me um so again look for things which you might not require be careful disabling things particularly if you don't know really what it does you know device install reboot required what is that i don't know i'd go and then look at that scheduled task and then we get any warnings um for, for problems we've not or for information we've not been able to get. Active setup, ooh, the devil's work. Yeah, it's not uh, it's not great. And there are better ways to do it, but a lot of applications leave stuff in there. It's designed so that you can set up an app once as uh, an admin or something like that, and any user can log on and then complete the setup. Controlled via these register keys as in uh, for 64-bit native apps and WOW 6432 node for 32-bit apps. Basically, you go in, see what's in those keys and if there's, if there's stuff which isn't required, and generally most stuff isn't required, just remove it because it slows stuff down. And again, we can see in the uh, pr process durations from that event log, uh, reaping from the process creation duration auditing that uh, what has actually been run by active setup as well and how long it's taken. Yeah, you know, copying the keys isn't too bad, but it depends what else it does. The, the ones for the browsers tend to be nasty ones which don't necessarily need to be used. Yeah, so go in with your uh, scalpel and surgically remove them from, from local machine. But like with all knowledge based articles you ever read about the registry, warning, you know, going doing stuff in the registry you don't really understand can cause problems. So make sure you've got a backup and that you can reinstate stuff. You know, I start deleting stuff. You know, if I've got a gold image, I can always go back to that. Otherwise, you know, if I'm doing it on the fly, then I'll export the key I'm going to delete to a, a, a reg file somewhere. So that if I break something badly, I can re-import it without having to go back to the, the base image. Yeah, um, that's my my view on it. Don't use it. But sometimes you inherit it because of you know, applications, particularly more traditional applications, it won't be stuck with for a long time yet. Forget all this SaaS and everything else. Yeah, how long before everybody uses SaaS apps and nobody needs a desktop yet? Uh, well, I'll, I'll still be working and I'm not exactly young. And we have the Apex logon stuff as well, which isn't quite active setup, but it's in that kind of similar uh, bracket. Okay, so some other useful things to look at. 
Now, uh, this is where it could be great presenting in person because I could then say show of hands for who remembers user M debug log, which was uh, a great way of getting a lot of information about logons that got retired and removed in about the XP timeframe. There is something, uh, again, this links to an article about it where you can drop in a, a registry value. Notice I said registry value, not key. Um, and that will produce you a, a group policy log file. So it gives you a better idea of, again, we're all with, every line has a timestamp. So what went on, what was loaded and from where. This is a much overlooked file. So let's go and have a look at that on this machine. That stuff in the wind, get our Windows Inf folder without the double N. Let's go and have a look at what there is. So you can see the setup api.dev and setup api. Uh, setup. So it's the setup api.dev that we want. And actually, what I can do here again using PowerShell magic is I can use if I go there and do a control space, it, it shows me everything that matches that star setup api. So I can just cursor over and let's go and have a look, see what's in here. Uh, I'm just going to reduce the font size slightly. Because if you've got a tick, this is very useful if you're in, uh, investigating a failed printer driver. Yeah, don't, here we are, 21st century and people still have to have printer drivers and printers. Yeah, great. So this will show you what's been installed and from where. So you can see this goes back quite a long way. This is probably from when it was actually you know, Microsoft making it because it's come from a gallery image. So if we go to the end of the file, control end, none of that scrolling stuff. So we can see in here, for instance, we've got some, oh, what does that mean? Access denied from query and remove. I don't know. And you know what? I don't care unless I'm in, unless I'm looking at what looks like a you know, printer issue, printing num, school SV, then yeah, I've got better things to do with my sorry little life then go and look at oh what 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 happened at 801 but again what i could do is if i was interested and there was a missing printer or missing printer driver and thus missing printer i could go and look at the event log aggregator script and say you know go and show me what happened between 801.48 and 801.50 to see if there's anything logged in the event log corresponding to this I could go and look at the processes to see if it was trying to run some yeah, from the process creation auditing to go and see if something ran around about that time, printer related. I could see the arguments, I could see the exit status. So as soon as I get the um, command out of there, I can then go and run it manually. One thing I forgot to say, actually, let's have a look. Control R to search, uh, search the duration is once I get the durations for a particular process, uh, I probably should have cut the time down. I probably should have given it the option, which I've forgotten. But any any particular command line you want. So anything, and this is just for a standard grid view. So any lines that you highlight, if I now press Control C, and then run up something like Notepad, you may have come across this Notepad tool. It was quite useful. You can see it's put that line into the clipboard. So if I do need to either investigate or go and use a search engine to look something up, or I need to uh, run that command with those command lines manually to see what happens. Do I get the same error when I run it manually? Then it, I don't have to retype it from here or export it to CSV. I can just uh, run it from uh, from the command line here. So I could yeah, put from this bit of the command line in because obviously it puts everything in. So again, very useful feature of, uh, of grid view that I can do that sort of thing. Right, where was I? Oh yeah, so the uh, setup api.dev log, log file. So here's some, let's see if we can actually find something vaguely interesting when something actually worked. Because again, I'm not troubleshooting anything, but particularly what you'll see is, oh, there we go. What you'll see is it as a section which is quite verbose, as we can see. So what we need to do is we need to go up and find, first of all, the date time of when the thing started. So we can see there are some date times here. So 0344, yeah, hopefully I'll still be in bed at that time. I've got to take my daughter to Manchester Airport at silly o'clock tomorrow, tomorrow morning. I'm really looking forward to that. Dad's taxi and all that. 
eventually at the top somewhere, top of the particular item, not top of the file. There we go. Ah, did I miss it? There we go. You'll see. And again, you, you can search, for instance, for these uh, chevrons or greater than to find your section start. So you can see this happened again. This isn't recent. Yeah, this must have been in the base image, although I've had this. Uh, well, it's called WVD, this desktop. That gives you an idea of how old it is. But it shows you what it's done. Oh, the good old TI worker process. If you ever watch Windows Update, that's eats more CPU. It's probably responsible for more global warming than many other things put together. But we can see what it's doing, what files it's looking at, what it's trying to look up. So this will help us look for failed you know, driver installations, for instance, print, particularly print drivers. Find that particularly useful file occasionally, not all, not all the time. But yeah, if it's device related, that's a great place. You can even find out when USB sticks were first plugged in, for instance, as long as you've got a persistent operating system, of course. Auto runs. Yeah, I'm kind of well, let's let's run it anyway. Uh, if I've got it installed, installed. No, I haven't got it installed. So let's do a quick copy. Talk amongst yourselves while I try and look like I know what I'm doing. Also runs my client map drive, 64-bit version, of course. And run it up. Ah, good job. I was prepared for this, wasn't it? This is what I do, although you know, sometimes people will build debugging tools into their base image as well, so at least they know where they are, which is good, as long as you remember to update them. So we can see you know, what's going to happen at log on. You know, it's always worth going through and optimizing, as in, why is it auto running that? Do I need that? No. So we can look up in here. This looks pretty clean, although I don't use OneDrive, so I could probably take OneDrive out of here. I'll well, probably come back, but there are other ways using image file execution options. And also a good you know, security tool, you know, what, what else is being hijacked, as in, um, in you know, third party code potentially running when uh, I wasn't expecting it to. I'll come back to that later as well. Uh, let's go back to slide. Yeah, what's in the, your, your base or default profile? Now, we used to use mandatory profiles that are a bit out of fashion these days. A, a lot of problems I came across were down to bloat or bad stuff or user specific stuff in the what should be a generic roaming profile. But you know, people use the default profile, the same applies there, although generally the default profile is cleaner. You know, embedding stuff in the default profile is, is not often used these days, it seems. It's much easier to do it more dynamically through. You know, group policy preferences, group policy, or, or whatever else. Otherwise, it can be a bit of a pain because if, if you're saying, well, where did this particular setting come from in the registry? There's, I think I did a talk on this a long time ago, and it's at least, I could find at least a dozen different ways that some uh, you know a setting could get into the registry from being in the base profile, from being in the, the user profile, if, it's a, you know, if they've logged on before, group policy, for logon scripts, there's uh, shadow registry keys, if you remember change user install, yeah, there's got to be at least a dozen. Yeah, what's security? Yeah, we always blame antivirus, but you know what, how many times have I disabled antivirus when I've installed software. Let me think, let me count them all again. Uh, none. Why? Because if something doesn't like being installed with antivirus, and I don't want to install that software, thank you very much. But we've got to see what is antivirus doing during the uh, doing the logon. Yeah, quite often with Propmon, I'll filter it out, but it might be it's somehow touching a, uh, a four gig ISO file and deciding to do a, a full scan of that. Mm, yeah, that, that's helpful, isn't it? Um, uh, good old, oh my, oh, almost a joke, Roman profiles. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, it's quite difficult to make jokes about this sort of stuff. Where well, most people are going for FS logics now, although, you know, UPM is from Citrix, user profile management is having a bit of a, a resurgence. So, you know, what is persisted in the profile? Is there too much persisted in the profile, particularly in terms of you know, stuff that need is, is got to run? Yeah, we saw the result of not doing the, the user logon, or rather doing the user logon, you get a load of the application compatibility stuff, 
which has been in since NT4 Terminal Server Edition, which came out in 1998. We were doing in in the uh, Citrix EUC world that sort of stuff long before then. We still had our own mechanism using Kicks, if anybody remembers that. Um, you know, CMD, VBS, but this was a generic mechanism. You know, scripts calling scripts calling scripts. Always best to uh, disable it, but you can put your own stuff in App Setup, and that's something else to look at when you're looking at slow logons. What is in App Setup? Is there something again running that shouldn't be? App init DLLs, if you don't know about it, yeah, you're a lucky person. This is a way to inject third party DLLs into any process. Uh, yes, any process. So it's, you know, it's quite a, it was quite a popular attack vector for malware. Also used to be used by people like Citrix, MF App Hook, if you've come across that. Uh, Avanti used to use it. A lot of AV uh, vendors do as a way of getting their DLLs, yeah, their code into third party processes, which can cause problems. Security software, strangely, doesn't like that. Um, and other things can run slowly or, or crash, because if you've got a problem in the, the third party DLL, it's got bad code in it and it will crash your process and you go oh words crashing oh microsoft yeah words rubbish and there's microsoft as soon as they look at this and they see something called detours which is now a, a free mechanism for uh, hijacking dlls which is how a lot of the app init dlls things work then they'll go nope remove that and come back to us and if it still crashes because basically third party code has crashed which they're not responsible for um these days, a lot of this stuff is done via device drivers, certainly Avanti, um, Environment Manager, uh, Application Control, which I know quite well, do it that way. Um, as does Citrix now, doesn't rely on the app init, because app init DLLs is horrible. It uses a space as a delimiter in that value. Yeah, a space, program space files. Hmm, you can start to see the problems. You have to get into 8.3 names, not great. Yeah, performance counters aren't dead yet. They can still give you you know, useful information, but you have to treat them with a pinch of salt if you're running in a you know, virtualized environment. You say, oh, yeah, CPU is low, but what if I can't get CPU when I need it anyway because the hypervisor's uh, overcommitted? So that's why you have to look at both levels, but there's some very useful performance counters. Again, I use Perfmon quite regularly still, and you can get performance counters in PowerShell as well. I, I bring this one up mainly because the, the slowest logon I have ever encountered was for a, uh, a customer when I, when I worked for uh, a large outsourcer. And the logon was 45 minutes. Minutes, not seconds, minutes. Why? Because it was a persistent image and the GPO cache in program data Microsoft somewhere just grew over time. And the, the GPO client service spent all its time processing the cache. And if so there was a log on it, happening, it would say, oh yeah, just hold on for a moment while I finish off what I'm doing. And sometimes that could take 45 minutes. Solution to that was to uh, remove the cache and then put in you know, scheduled tasks to do that at regular intervals. As there wasn't really any need for the cache. And again, another good reason to use non-persistent. How did I find that? With process monitor. And of course, good old temp files. OK, well, that is actually a world record, I think, and that I've actually got to the end of a deck and a presentation in the allotted time. Any questions from members of the audience or their pets or anything like that? This is where you say, Guy, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> As you know, we, there is a lot of different products from our monitoring partners and sponsors. and. You know, it's a bit confusing. What is uh, the Windows duration? What is the time from from uh, timing to interactive session? What's your take on that? You know, the different parts, ready for share or attempt stuff. Yeah, it is, it is all a bit subjective, and this is where the, the the ideal is to compare good with bad. So you don't have to know the absolute definition of something, but it, let's say with that, you know, control on logon analysis script, then you know, we look at a a trace or the output for a good logon and the, the output for a bad logon and spot the difference. So, yeah, let's say it was something like the yeah, yeah, um, profile loading. So profile loading took 30 seconds in one and 10 in the other. 
okay, so what am I going to do? Well, then I'm going to drill into my other tools. So I'm going to drill into the event aggregator script to look at what events happened during that period. Also look at the process uh, creation and termination, particularly uh, what processes terminated round about the time that that profile load finished. So you, you're bringing in all the kind of data from your various different sources or from the event log anyway. You know, if you've got process monitor, great. Then you can do it at the time. Otherwise, you, you know, you have to look for, for clues. It might even be log files. You know, sometimes the FS logics log files will uh, will pop up and oh look, my timer has now expired. <clears throat> Again, like I said, you know, a useful another PowerShell script worth getting is this, so you don't have to worry about Windows clocks and scribbling things in books. You can just click mark. Guy shut up. You know, chance would be a fine thing. And then I've got it so I can look. And actually, this one writes persistently to a CSV file as well, so I can look back at something I did yeah, last week, so I can compare, yeah, I can look at the event logs or whatever else. Anyway, sorry, I digress. 